Welcome to Double Deal, a series about organized crime in 20th century Boston. The stories of our central character, Richard Tchaikovsky. The criminals, the crimes, and the law enforcement officers who ruled the streets. Nina and I will be your guides through the darkest streets of Boston, telling you the true stories of criminals, crimes, and lies. Welcome back, everyone. Today, Nina and I are discussing the gangland slayings that occurred in the Boston area in 1964. We'll be talking about the victims, the hitters, and our theories about why these men were targeted and who the actual perpetrators might have been. The title, The Hit Parade, might sound strange to some, but in those days, if someone was marked to be taken out, the guys would say, so-and-so is on the hit parade. Eighteen men were killed between March and December of 1964, including one in Rhode Island. Jimmy Flemmy murdered Margaret Sylvester in October, but we will not be covering her murder in this episode. Although many people, including the authorities, knew who committed these murders, no one except for Georgie McLaughlin and Robert Cook were ever tried. And we have our doubts that Georgie actually killed the first victim that year. When we were reviewing witness statements, court testimonies, and press coverage of the William Sheridan murder, we were shocked by the conflicting information that was given. Since William was the first victim that year, we'll start with his murder. We're going to take you through Georgie's apprehension and trial before we move on to the other slayings. Included in that timeline will be the prior attempts on Georgie's brother, Punchy, and those made on Georgie. We won't cover the details about Punchy's slaying until episode 32. Before we get into Sheridan's murder, let's give a brief background again on the McLaughlin brothers and the ongoing feud between them and the Winter Hill gang led by Buddy McLean. We had a whole episode dedicated to the alleged origin of the conflict that we called On the Waterfront since many of the players were longshoremen. I'd encourage you to go back and listen to it for more depth. I'll just introduce our main characters again, starting with the McLaughlin brothers. Edward Punchy McLaughlin was born on May 16, 1917. Punchy got his nickname from his time as an amateur boxer in the 30s and 40s. Next, there was Bernie, born December 30, 1921, and Georgie was born in 1927. Their parents were John and Anna McLaughlin, both born in Ireland. There were 11 kids in total, five boys, and six girls. Their mother, Anna McLaughlin, died in June of 41. Two years later, one of the McLaughlin boys, John, died in a car accident on his way home from Baltimore to celebrate Father's Day with his family. He was just 23 years old. Then, in January of 45, the oldest McLaughlin boy, Charles, died while serving in World War II in the Philippines. The three surviving brothers were Punchy, Bernie, and Georgie. Their arch-rival, Buddy McLean, shot Bernie once in the head and four times in the body on October 31, 1961, in broad daylight with over 100 witnesses present. Buddy and Bobo Petriconi were charged the following day. A police officer, Russ Nicholson, wasn't charged, even though he was known to be the getaway driver. Nicholson was murdered in May 1964, and we'll be discussing his murder later in the episode. No indictment was returned for Bernie's murder, but on May 16, 1962, Buddy was sentenced to two years in Walpole State Prison for an earlier charge of assault and destruction of property. Buddy McLean had been an FBI informant since at least 1960, but we think it was probably much earlier than that. In 1960, Jerry Angiulo, Raymond Patriarca's underboss, was approached by one of his men. He told Jerry that he had heard that Buddy McLean was an informant for the FBI. Jerry's response was, Whoever said that is a fucking idiot. Jerry was curious why Buddy would be helping the feds, so he questioned the allegation. The response was that the feds hated the McLaughlins as much as Buddy did, and both wanted to wipe them out any way they could. Jerry's man asked if he should let the McLaughlins know. Jerry's response was, fuck no, I fucking hate those assholes. They've been grabbing up sections of Boston, and they're always looking for more. However, as you'll see in this episode, Jerry's opinion changed and shifted as time went on, and the conflict between the rival gangs became a part of everyday life in Boston. At a Labor Day picnic in 61, the McLean gang beat Georgie McLaughlin to within an inch of his life and almost left him for dead before thinking better of it and leaving him on the front lawn of a hospital in Newburyport. In November that same year, Georgie was involved in a serious car accident when his car overturned on Cambridge Street in Brighton. He was hospitalized, suffering from multiple lacerations and contusions of the face and body. The police said that the accident had occurred because of wet road conditions, but the timing was awfully suspicious since it was just a couple of weeks after his brother Bernie had been murdered. Six months later, Georgie was beaten and stabbed. 
He had been seen driving his late brother Bernie's car on the evening of May 8th. Police were called to 3rd Street in Chelsea at 4 in the morning on May 9th, where they found his blood-soaked car on the side of the road, but Georgie had disappeared. When the cops went to search the surrounding area for clues, the car sped off. That same morning, a man appeared in a nearby hospital with a knife wound to his throat. Georgie was scheduled to appear in court on the 17th for an appeal on an automobile violation, but he failed to show. His lawyer stated that Georgie had been beaten over the head with a lead pipe and was unable to appear. Georgie continued to lay low after that. Now that our listeners have some background, let's talk about the first slaying of 64. On March 15th, at roughly one in the morning, William J. Sheridan was shot once in the head after leaving a christening party that had taken place in Roxbury. He was just 20 years old. Although he did have one prior arrest, he had no convictions and worked as a bank teller. When the shooting occurred, he was stepping out of the entrance to the building where the party had taken place. Fifteen witnesses were interviewed at the scene. On the 16th, an article ran in the Boston Globe describing the scene and what forensics had determined. It stated that Sheridan was killed by a sniper from a long distance. A larger than twenty two caliber bullet entered between his eyes but the medical examiner was clear in stating that it was a, quote, small round ammunition, unquote. But the police said that it was a case of mistaken identity and that Georgie McLaughlin believed he shot Buddy McLean at close range. Mind you, Georgie supposedly had an argument with Sheridan. Considering how many times Georgie had been in the company of Buddy McLean, that theory doesn't make any sense. And how could Georgie have shot him from a building across the street when he was standing in front of the building when the shooting happened? Initially, a 30-year-old woman who lived in the building and was friends with both Georgie and William Sheridan was detained. She was held without bail until a hearing that was scheduled for April 1st. She was cleared and released during the hearing, but by now a warrant had been issued for the arrest of Georgie. In May, Georgie was added to the FBI's top 10 most wanted list for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. The feds detailed how Georgie had been court-martialed from the Navy in 1947 for his bad conduct and how his psychiatric exam at that time determined that he had, quote, a psychopathic personality marked by aggressive tendencies, unquote. Acquaintances noted that he had a drinking problem and could become violent when drunk. In the early morning hours of July 25, 1964, more than 20 uniformed police and detectives raided a Beacon Hill apartment building. A woman had phoned the police at about four in the morning, reporting that she believed that Georgie was hiding out in the building. But of course, he wasn't there. This time, the sedan was white with Florida plates, and Georgie was alleged to have a machine gun in his car. In August, after Harold Hannon was found dead, the state police stated that Hannon's car was the one that Georgie was seen fleeing the Sheridan murder scene in. We'll get into Hannon's murder later in this episode. You might remember if you listened to episode 13 that Georgie's fancy green sedan matched the description of the vehicle used during the attempt on Spex O'Keefe's life during the Brink saga. But the plates were not New Jersey plates, nor was the vehicle purchased in New Jersey. Even so, Georgie's car was impounded. On November 18, 1964, Sam Kufari and Jerry Angulo met with Raymond Patriarca at the coin the wiretap there picked up Kufari, stating that he had recently been in Hot Springs, Arkansas. He'd been down there getting married, but he failed to mention that little detail to Raymond and Jerry. Anyway, he told them that he had heard that Georgie McLaughlin had been down there about six months prior, but, quote, the locals wanted no part of him, unquote, and he didn't remain in Hot Springs very long. Jerry told them that he'd been in contact with an unnamed individual who was attempting to make arrangements for Georgie McLaughlin's surrender. The district attorney, Garrett Byrne, had apparently agreed to a bond in the amount of $35,000. And Julo said that he'd been told by the person, who I believe was Punchy McLaughlin, to make sure that he got a definite deal from Byrne because he did not trust him. And he was right. Five days later, at just after 11 o'clock in the morning, Punchy McLaughlin was shot with a 12-gauge sawed-off shotgun while he sat in his parked car on Regent Circle near Beacon Street in Brookline, near Washington Square. And that's nowhere near the Beth Israel Hospital in case Frankie Salemi is listening and can't recall the area he claims to have shot Punchy in. The initial police report said that Punchy had been partially dragged from his car by an assailant who had first shot through the car window, shattering it. But the gunman was forced to flee in a black 1962 Pontiac sedan with Rhode Island registration plates after witnesses stopped at the scene. 
Punchy staggered from his bloodstained car to the barbershop of the Beaconsfield Hotel where he collapsed. He was rushed to Beth Israel Hospital by the police who said he was in critical condition. It didn't look like he'd survive and the last rites were administered before he was wheeled into what would be an eight hour surgery. The shots had smashed his jaw and sliced his liver. When the cops asked Punchy who had shot him, he shook his head, which the cops took to mean that he didn't know, but maybe he just wouldn't say. The area where the attack took place was one of Punchy's regular haunts. He frequently purchased boxes of candy at a nearby shop, and a two-pound box from the same store was sitting on the front seat of his car at the time of the attack. He'd been warned to stay away from the neighborhood as his life was in danger, but he'd returned to the area for a meeting with an unnamed man who Punchy refused to identify. A few days later, Raymond Patriarca told Sammy Granito that the assailants should have used double O buckshot instead of the bird shot they apparently did. He added that one of the hardest ways to attack an individual was to attack him from the outside while the supposed victim was inside the car. More of Raymond's words of wisdom. He also theorized about who might have done the attempted hit, but as usual, Raymond knew less than nothing. He told Sammy Granito not to get involved with either the McLeans or the McLaughlins, saying that he intended to let them fight it out and step in when the fight was over. Raymond stated that Buddy McLean had told Teddy Fucolo to tell Raymond that he wanted no trouble with the Italians. Raymond sent word back that as long as Buddy and his people didn't bother his people, Raymond didn't care what he did. However, in another memo sent by Special Agent John Kehoe, he reported that Raymond had said that because of his association with the McLaughlin brothers, he would favor them. Decades later, Frankie Salemi claimed that he and Stevie Flemmy had dressed as rabbis in the Beth Israel parking lot to take a shot at Punchy, but that was categorically untrue. The man sat in front of a Senate committee and lied through his teeth. And the press ran with that bullshit story. No one checked the news articles or the Brookline Police Department reports about the attempted hit to verify what Frankie said. Obviously, Slummy had read the articles years back and the Beth Israel Hospital was the only detail that stuck in his head. And what, because Israel was part of the name he threw in the rabbi bit? I can't. <laughs> it's true. You know I've been coming through his statements and we'll tear them apart as we go. Three weeks later, Punchy was ready to go into hiding. His associate, Spike O'Toole's life, was also under threat. He and Francis Xavier Murray had received telegrams threatening their lives the day before they were set to be released from prison. The telegrams read, quote, you will receive the same benefits as Harold, meaning Hannon. We'll get into Hannon's murder later on in this episode. The Stadies took the threat seriously and gave the two men protection as they left the jail. The first person that Spike went to see after being released was Punchy, who likely sent him to see his brother, Georgie, who was still on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Dorothy Barchard brought a suit against Spike for non-support of their two toddler daughters in January of 65. It was not her own idea. She had applied for aid from the state, but officials had insisted that she name the father of her children. Otherwise, they said she would not be eligible for assistance. Spike was arraigned on morals charges for having two children out of wedlock with Dorothy. When he was brought in by the police, Spike admitted to him that he was a friend of Georgie McLaughlin's. And when he was asked further if he knew where Georgie was, Spike answered deadpan, probably shot up someplace. On February 24th, 1965, Georgie was apprehended in an apartment in Dorchester along with Spike. We both believe that Dorothy was the one who tipped off the feds, most likely Special Agent Rico, who she'd been informing to since 1956. They were arraigned the following day and held without bail for 30 days until a hearing was scheduled. John Fitzgerald represented Georgie during the hearing while he was guarded by 100 officers. His case was bound over to Superior Court and a hearing took place on March 4th. During that hearing, Fitzgerald's partner, Al Farisi, represented Georgie. Farisi and the ADA Pino had a heated argument. Pino promised Farisi that he would be allowed to interview the witnesses, one of whom had just flown back from California. Maureen Delamano was also indicted as an accessory after the fact in the murder of Sheridan because Georgie was in her apartment just after Sheridan had been shot. The newspapers described her as a striking platinum blonde. 
According to witness testimony, Delamano screamed, George just shot someone immediately after Sheridan was killed. Two days after the shooting, when the police searched her apartment, a gun was found hidden in a TV set, but it was not the murder weapon. On April 9, 1965, Spike O'Toole and Francis Bethany were also indicted as accessories after the fact. Spike was held at Charles Street Jail, but Francis, like Maureen, was free on bail. The trial was set for October 5th. Georgie had to sign a waiver as he had the right to a speedy trial, but the court wanted to delay it because they claimed he wouldn't receive a fair trial. In the meantime, Georgie was being held in the hole at Charles Street, and a guard was assigned to watch him in his cell 24 hours a day because of the escape risk that Charles Street was prone to. In an August letter written to Massachusetts Attorney General Edward Brooke, Georgie wrote, This letter is in no way trying to entice or involve you or your decision in my present case, but merely a humble appeal for your legal knowledge or guidance concerning my incarceration. The legality of the manner of my treatment here is very much in question. The treatment here for the past five months has been one of a convicted man. I have only been indicted and awaiting for my trial. The letter continued, No man awaiting trial here has to wear striped prison clothing except me. They keep me incommunicado from the other men waiting trial with a court officer or jail officer posted outside my door to fulfill this duty. Any inmate who attempts to approach me to even say hello is threatened with a solitary confinement lockup in which he will lose his due visiting privileges, etc. Officers are instructed not to converse with me. All my meals are brought to me in my cell. There is no requested chair in my cell. I have to stand up and eat off a two-foot high shelf. My family is not allowed to visit me on regular visiting days. If the deputy sheriff is not here to sanction it on the other days, they cannot visit me. When visitors do receive permission, they have to converse with me through the bars of the window of my cell. Any normal parcels, sandwiches, magazines left for me at the front door are accepted by the officer in charge of the door, but never reach me. Longtime service officers working here inform me that to their knowledge, I am the only inmate ever not allowed to attend the church service of his faith. This is only scratching the surface of the ill treatment I have been receiving here for five months. There is more to this unnecessary harassment that I have been receiving than just security provisions. However, the issue at hand is not to expose any individuals, but only to seek fair and impartial treatment like any other indicted man awaiting trial. The Office of the Attorney General acknowledged that they'd received the letter, but were unsympathetic to the inhumane conditions that George was being kept in. Quote, I am sure that you are aware that maximum security must be maintained in cases where a person is awaiting trial for a capital offense. From the description of the treatment described in your letter, it would appear that this is what is being done. I find nothing to indicate such treatment is inhumane. However, if you feel that certain rights of yours are being violated, I suggest that you bring this to the attention of your attorneys. They are very competent and would know just how to handle such a situation, end quote. These people were sick. They'd be the first one to lecture you about the Soviet gulags, though. As a punishment for his letter to the attorney general, even the prison uniform was taken away with the justification that Georgie might commit suicide. Quote, you wouldn't keep an animal in a cage like this. I've never seen anything like it, Georgie's attorney told the Boston Globe journalist Jerome Sullivan. On August 31st, a judge denied a petition by attorney John E. Fitzgerald for Georgie to be allowed to wear civilian clothing, attend mass, and have visitors. As Georgie was sitting naked in Charles Street awaiting trial in complete violation of his rights, Punchy was hiding out in Canton trying to avoid assassins. But someone knew exactly where he was holed up because at just a little afternoon on August 16th, as Punchy drove along Canton Street in Westwood, on his way to West Roxbury for an appointment, another attempt was made on his life. Near the Norfolk Golf Club, a car with three or four men in it pulled alongside him. A hail of bullets peppered his car, at least one of them going through the windshield and smashing his right hand. About 15 shots were fired in all, most of them smashing into the car. Punchy, in a frantic effort to escape, drove left-handed at high speed on Route 128, moving the wrong way down an entrance ramp, then north on the southbound lane of 128, to a gas station on Route 1 in Westwood, where he staggered into the office and collapsed, his clothing covered in blood. The gas station attendant applied a makeshift tourniquet with his belt and notified the police. 
Shell casings found near the scene of the attack were described by police as slightly less than 38 caliber from an automatic weapon. Punchy was first taken to the hospital in Norwood, where he told the local police chief that he didn't see who shot him, quote, and I don't know why they should want to kill me, unquote. Punchy was given blood plasma and transferred to Mass General Hospital, where his right hand had to be amputated. After a 16-day hospital stay, Punchy returned to Canton, but his hideout was no longer a secret. The same day that Georgie's appeal for better jail conditions was rejected, Punchy told the Boston Globe's Jerome Sullivan, quote, They were lying in wait for me. I think they'd been watching and waiting for many days. The funny part of it is I had been up very early that morning and had gone into town to get the papers. Nothing happened. Then about noon, I pulled out from the house. I was heading for West Roxbury on an errand. As I drove along, I noticed a beach wagon with some men in it on Dedham Street. They put on the brakes and followed me. They had a walkie-talkie and were in contact with some guys hiding in the woods. One of them was in a tree. I think they were about to give up their stakeout for the day when I drove along. Then came the bullets from a repeating rifle and a machine gun. The first bullet went through the windshield and ripped into my right hand. Fifteen or twenty more tore the, into the car, raking it the side of it. I had to drive left-handed with my right hand hanging by my side, bleeding like the devil. Unquote. A little over a month after the attempt on his life, Punchy was fitted with a prosthetic hand. Frankie Salemi tried to take credit for this second murder attempt on Punchy's life, too, saying that after they botched it, FBI Special Agent Rico showed up at his shop with a newspaper report in his hand. Boy, what a sloppy piece of work that was. Other people could have got hurt. I don't know where this his starting point is, Frankie admitted to Rico. A few days after that, Salemi claimed that Rico showed up again with a piece of paper that he slipped to him with Punchy's address and Canton on it. But his timeline is totally off. According to Frankie, Rico didn't tell them where Punchy was staying until after the second botched attempt. But that's impossible because the only way he and Stevie Fleming would have been able to lie in wait for Punchy and Canton was if they knew where Punchy was staying and what route he'd be taking into town. I don't buy that Frankie or Stevie were involved in any of the attempts on Punchy's life. I think that Frankie perjured himself for two reasons. First, because he needed to maintain his street cred. Frankie had made a deal with the feds and was placed in witness protection in 2003. But in order to make that happen, he needed to make himself out to be a much more important than he actually was. Copping to unsolved murders that he didn't actually commit gave him more leverage with the feds and helped him to get a better deal. In exchange, he had to sit in front of the congressional committee and perjure himself. Second, and perhaps more importantly, Frankie was trying to hide the fact that he was a confidential informant for the FBI. He was given a CI number in early 1963 before both Buddy McLean and the Flemmy brothers. You have to imagine that since Salemi does not appear to have had an arrest record prior to that, it was sim a similar story to Richie's. The feds trapped him in some kind of a sting operation and left him no real choice, life in prison or cooperate. I just have more respect for Frankie if he had admitted it all those years later. Most likely he was dropped from the program sometime after Rico told him and Stevie to go on the lam in September of 69. Clearly, part of the deal Frankie made with the feds in 03 was that they wouldn't publicize his past as a confidential informant. I completely agree with you. As we move on through this season and the next, we'll revisit Salemi's claims. The trial of Georgie, Spike, Delamano, and Bithany commenced on October 5th as scheduled. Attorney Joseph Sachs was representing O'Toole. Fitzgerald was representing Delamato, Robert Stanziani was representing Bithany, Alfarezi was representing Georgie, and Forte was the trial judge. Georgie's brother Punchy made it his mission to be present in the courtroom during the trial. At the trial, it was revealed that Thomas Lynch had an argument with Brendan Flaherty the evening of the shooting. After the run-in, he went into the ground floor apartment to get a beer. According to these witnesses, they saw Georgie with a pistol in his hand in the courtyard and Sheridan in the doorway to the building about three feet apart from each other. Thomas Berry was the first to testify. He stated that he didn't see the shooting, but did hear Delamano yell out that Georgie killed someone. Flaherty was the second witness to testify, and upon questioning by Farisi, he said that he had had six whiskey highballs prior to the shooting and didn't actually see Georgie shoot Sheridan, but rather only heard Delamano scream that he had. 
Flaherty couldn't even remember how he got to the party. And how would she know anyway? She was in the apartment when the shooting happened, not present at the scene. And again, the medical examiner had said that Sheridan was shot from either across the street or from a building across from the doorway. He never said anything about close range. And as late as April 1965, the media was still reporting it that way. A sniper took out Sheridan. But during the second day of testimony, a former Marine, Herbert Jocelyn, stated that he was 15 to 20 feet away from Georgie and Sheridan at the entrance to the building, and they appeared to be arguing. Jocelyn went on to say that Georgie was holding what appeared to be a 45 caliber Colt pistol with a 7 to 8 inch long barrel. Again, the medical examiner had stated that Sheridan was killed with a weapon that was slightly larger than a 22 caliber. Look, there's a huge difference between a 22 and a 45. I was the proud owner of a 45 caliber Colt combat commander. Granted, I only ever fired a weapon at the range, but if you're shooting at something with a 45 at close range, you're going to blow a giant hole in it. A headshot at three feet from a 45 would nearly blow someone's head off. How could the medical examiner and forensics team make such a mistake? They didn't make a mistake. The feds held back the evidence because it didn't match the story they wanted told. Back to the trial. The next witness to testify was Donald Buckley. It was his aunt who was holding the christening party. Sheridan had an argument with her shortly before he was killed, and according to Buckley, Sheridan wanted to go back in and apologize to Buckley's aunt, but Buckley told him to leave it alone. Sheridan, Buckley's brother and a friend, walked him out around 11 p.m. So where was Sheridan for the two hours before he got killed, just loitering in the hall? Buckley was inside when he heard a noise that he thought was a firecracker after midnight, and when he went out, he saw Sheridan lying in the building entrance with a bullet hole between his eyes. Thomas Lynch testified that he also had an argument with Georgie that evening over a bottle of beer. When Georgie refused to take the beer bottle from him, he went inside of Delamano's apartment to get one. It was shortly after that when Sheridan was shot. Again, he only heard the shot and didn't witness the shooting. Forgive me, but what sort of a christening party was this? Drunks having petty beefs over beers and who knows what? Where was the poor baby during this whole thing? It's beyond trashy. Sorry. The following day, FBI Special Agent Leonard Frizzoli testified about Georgie's arrest on February 24, 1965. He described the raid and the arrest of Georgie and Spike O'Toole. Spike and Bethany had rented the second floor apartment under her name about 10 days prior to their arrest. Upon cross-examination, Frizzoli stated that Bethany and her child were screaming. Spike was found in his bed in his underwear. Georgie was also in the bedroom. At the time, the only person the feds had a warrant for was Georgie, but the other two were taken in initially for harboring a fugitive. Frankie Salemi claimed later that Rico had asked Frankie for a throwaway gun and Salemi had provided Rico with an untraceable thirty-eight. He told Frankie that he intended to kill Georgie when they raided his hideout. When it didn't go down that way, Frank says that he questioned Rico about it, and Rico said that the other feds had all agreed to it, but there was one holdout, and they'd had to shelve the idea. It's so similar to the raid on Louis Aquila and Frank Martin Feeney in Minneapolis in 1957 in the timing and technique, and Spike was shacked up with another woman while Dorothy was suing him for child support. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Dorothy had to be the one who gave them up, just like with Louis Aquella and Frank Feeney. I'll save my breath about Frankie for now. And as for Rico, the one holdout had to be Special Agent Coleman, the Boy Scout, who was eventually driven out of the FBI. Between Dad's stories and Pro's antics, Coleman must have been losing his mind. On October 20th, Punchy McLaughlin was killed while waiting to board a bus to the courthouse. He was shot seven times on the corner of the VFW Parkway in Spring Street in West Roxbury. It was the third and final attempt on Punchy's life. Frankie Salemi tried to take credit for the final hit on Punchy, too. The only reason to think that he and C.V. Filmy may have done the first two is because Punchy survived both. And let's be honest, Frank Salemi was totally incompetent. But the truth of the matter is that Punchy McLaughlin was such a savage that he beat death twice, not because his assassins were unskilled. But the trial continued on. On October 23rd, the sister of the only eyewitness took the stand. Janice Jocelyn said her brother told her in a phone conversation that he was drunk when the shooting happened and that he didn't know anything. She went on to say that she tried phoning her brother on February 25th, 1965, the day after Georgie was captured. 
Herbert Jocelyn had been living in California since the shooting. According to her, he called her back the following day and told her, why don't they leave me alone? I don't know anything. I was drunk. When Herbert was questioned, he said he never received any phone calls from his sister, but New England Telephone supplied the records showing multiple attempts to contact him. Plus, his sister had a witness to her phone calls who also testified. California never produced any records until Georgie's appeal years later, but there were no calls from that number. But that doesn't mean he didn't call from somewhere else. Punchy McLaughlin was buried the following day, but the Suffolk County Sheriff refused to allow Georgie to attend the funeral. On the final day of the trial, Georgie made a statement, quote, I tell you, the shot that killed Sheridan was meant for me, not that kid. I had a brother who was watching this case every day. He was shot down while on his way, end quote. I couldn't find any trial testimony regarding the ballistics reports. Had Farisi done his job, it would have been clear that Georgie couldn't have killed Sheridan since the guns didn't match. The notion that Georgie would mistake Sheridan for Buddy just a couple of feet from Sheridan and after having an argument is ridiculous. He and his brothers knew Buddy personally and had more than ample face time with him to know the difference. There wasn't even a resemblance between them. Al Farisi punted. Any decent defense lawyer would have gotten Georgie acquitted on the ballistics alone. He let Georgie get the death penalty. We'll be talking about Al, his background, and his other cases in the next episode. It is far more plausible that Georgie was correct that the kill shot was intended for him and not for Sheridan at all. To recap, Georgie had had three known attempts on his life by the time of the Sheridan murder. First at the Labor Day picnic in 1961 when the McLean crew beat him to within an inch of his life and almost left him for dead before thinking better of it and leaving him on the front lawn of a hospital in Newburyport. Then the car accident in November that same year and another beating in May of 62. Georgie's brother Bernie had been murdered by Buddy McLean in broad daylight in October of 61. And Punchy had two attempts on his life before he was finally assassinated in October of 65. Of course, we have our theories. First, we believe that the hitter was pro learner. As you know, pro was a member of Jack Kelly's crew by this time. In addition to his skill with a bat, he was also a skilled sniper. Few, if any, of the other hitters in the area had that skill, but Pro did. The second reason is the stories that Laura overheard over the years. We don't want to cover the Buddy McLean assassination in this episode, but the similarity in technique between Sheridan and Buddy's murders is striking. Now the why. As we mentioned in prior episodes, Jack Kelly and his crew were initially aligned with the McLaughlins. Dad got picked up by FBI Special Agent Rico in early 1962 when he was running guns for the McLaughlins. But along the way, Punchy started to pressure Jack Kelly, looking to shake him down over the Plymouth mail robbery. Ronald Wysocki wrote an article that ran on December 24, 1964, claiming that Jack had Punchy shot because he was blackmailing him, although the article only referred to Jack as the Plymouth mail gang. When Punchy was shot in Brookline, he had $25,000 on him, which was believed to be part of the extortion payment. I heard the same story that Punchy was shaking down Jack. Punchy should have known that Jack wasn't going to play that game with him. It would have been worth the twenty-five grand to Jack to get Punchy out of his hair. So possibly the bullet was meant to kill Georgie as a warning to Punchy, but Georgie moved after Pro pulled the trigger and Sheridan took the bullet instead. The second theory is that Buddy McLean was the target and Pro mistook Sheridan for Buddy since the shot was fired from so far away. The reason Jack had it in for Buddy was that Buddy was sleeping with the wife of one of his crew members. I don't want to name her here as it's never been made public. Although she's deceased, I know for certain her relatives are listening. Jack knew about the affair and also knew that Buddy was trying to get close to her husband as Buddy suspected he was involved in the Plymouth heist. Jack wouldn't let that happen. I can't imagine that Pro would have made that kind of mistake, though. I still think that Georgie was right, that he was the target. We'll never know the answer, but if Georgie is still alive and free, as we believe he is, and if any of our listeners know him, please let him know that we believe he was innocent of the murder of William Sheridan. Yes, if any of our listeners have contact with him, please pass that message along. Let's move on to the next slaying of 1964. Francis Benjamin's body was found on May 4th. 
His body was discovered headless in the trunk of a stolen car that had been abandoned in an Old Harbor Village in South Boston. Benjamin was the father of six. He had been released from Walpole Prison two weeks prior to his death, where he had served five years for armed robbery. The medical examiner believed that he had been shot in the head before being beheaded. The FBI alleged that Jimmy Flemmy shot Benjamin with a revolver that was stolen from a policeman and cut off his head so a ballistic match couldn't be made, which, quite frankly, sounds exactly like something a Flemmy would do. Stevie and the team. <laughs> totally. Hey, maybe it was their brother Michael's gun. Possible. But according to the book Love and Feared, Buddy McLean, Benjamin had walked into a bar and said that Buddy McLean was going to wipe out the entire McLaughlin gang and take over Charlestown. Supposedly, an unnamed man from Roxbury, who was an ally of the McLaughlins, walked up to him and shot him in the head. After that, the man called Punchy to help him dispose of the body. The same theory about why the head was cut off was repeated in that story. But there's no way in hell if Jimmy was the killer that he was going to call Punchy. Jimmy was aligned with Buddy and claimed Punchy was out to kill him. I tend to believe that it was Jimmy. Benjamin and he had been in the can together. Who knows what kind of a beef they had with each other or maybe it was over drugs. Benjamin's murder was never solved. A little over a week later on May 12, 33-year-old former MDC police officer Russell Nicholson was shot to death. His body was found wrapped in a blanket on a stream embankment in the woods off of Indian Springs at 9.30 in the morning. The authorities were concerned at first that the body was Georgie McLaughlin, who was still on the lam for the Sheridan murder. Nicholson had been the getaway driver for Buddy McLean when he and Bobo Petriconi murdered Bernie McLaughlin. He resigned after charges of being in the company of people of ill repute. One theory was that Stevie Hughes and Wilfred Delaney scooped up Nicholson while he was out shaking down married men who were having affairs. They drove him out to Wilmington, where Punchy and Georgie were waiting. Punchy shot him, followed by Georgie, who said, this is for Bernie. Now, how anyone would know that story is the question. When we get to the murders of Hannon and Delaney, we might have an answer. Of course, the newspapers ran that Punchy had it in for Nicholson and had vowed to kill him even if it meant his own demise. The police said that Russell was killed somewhere else and taken to the woods afterwards. So that does not match the story told in Buddy's biography. I do believe that someone from the McLaughlin crew killed Nicholson, but no one was ever tried for his murder and it still remains unsolved. We should also note that just after just about every murder in 1964, Georgie's name was brought into it either as a suspect or as a friend of the victim. I want to mention another murder that happened just a few days after Nicholson was killed. Anthony Brazzo of Chelsea was dumped off by someone in the hallway of a Revere hospital after he was shot in the head. Before the man took off, he shouted that his friend was hurt. Brazzo's car was found in the parking lot of Rivera Strip Mall. The police said that it was used to drop Brazzo off at the hospital. At the time of his murder, he was an insurance salesman with a wife and child, but he did have a record. He was arrested with Connie Frizee, a cohort of Joe Barboza's, in 1945 for an attempted robbery in Boston's West End. Then in 1946, he was arrested in Chelsea for shooting at a patrol car. He was sentenced later that year to 12 to 15 years in state prison in New Hampshire for armed robbery and kidnapping. A nurse identified James L. Collins as the person who had dropped Brazzo off at the hospital. Collins was arrested on murder charges but was never indicted. No further arrests were made and eventually Brazzo's name was dropped from the running list of gangland slayings. But considering his association with Connie Frizee, I suspect it wasn't a case of mistaken identity. Brazzo survived in the hospital for two weeks before succumbing to his wounds. His murder is still unsolved and unlikely to and, and likely to remain so. Connie Frizee died in 2000. The next two victims were Vincent Biasi and Paul Calici. On July 23rd, both were found shot to death in the trunk of Calici's car in Quincy, Mass. Both had been shot in the head. And speaking of cars, both of them had been seen the month before riding around in Harold Hannon's green sedan. Both Kalichi and Bisset had been seen, hadn't been seen for 10 days prior to their bodies being found. On July 13th, Kalichi was reported missing. And on July 19th, the Providence Police Department had issued a missing persons alert for Bisset. Kalichi had served 10 years in Charlestown State Prison for gem theft and had been convicted of illegal possession of a firearm in a Providence court in the beginning of that July. 
His record dated back to the 1940s. He was a paratrooper before being dishonorably discharged from the army. Kalichi even wrote a letter to Raymond Patriaca while in prison referring to him as boss. That letter was never sent. Both men were said to be associates of Raymond's, but the Providence police said B.C. was clean. Carlton Eaton was brought in for questioning in that double homicide, but was never charged. Carlton himself would become a murder victim two months later. We'll cover his death shortly. Eaton wasn't the only one questioned. Raymond Patriarca was contacted by the Providence PD about the murders. Patriarca stated that he thought that Kalichi was a little soft in the head and had tried to shake down many people when he was in jail. However, since he had been released, he had apparently attempted to live a good life. Louis the Fox Talionetti was also questioned and told Raymond that he had furnished no information to the cops. Raymond told him that he'd really told the cops off and practically had thrown them out of his office. But Patriarca was very affable to the cops, according to Special Agent Kehoe's monitoring of the wiretap at the Coinomatic. Further discussions seemed to indicate that Raymond was not responsible for the murder, nor did he know who was. However, in September, Raymond gave Sammy Granito money to give to Joseph J.R. Russo and Vincent DeCicio in appreciation for the murder of the pair. And the feds knew this because it was on the wiretap at Raymond's and Special Agent Kehoe reported it in a memo to Hoover in D.C., but the feds did nothing. In late July, Henry Tamilio reported to Raymond that the BPD were looking for Romeo Martin because they had heard he'd been murdered. They contacted Ronnie Cassessa, who produced Martin at a local precinct station to prove that he was still alive. Tamilio advised Raymond that he had attempted to contact Wimpy Bennett but had been unable to locate him. He had wanted to ask Wimpy about the recent double homicide. Patriarca stated that it was probably a good thing that Tamilio hadn't been able to get in touch with Wimpy, quote, what we don't know about, we are not responsible for, unquote. More Raymondisms. <laughs> like the others, the Kalichi and BC murders were never solved. Less than two weeks later, on August 4th, the bodies of Harold Hannon and Wilfred Delaney were found. Their naked bodies were spotted in the Boston Harbor. Hannon's hands and feet had been bound with tape and rope. He was blindfolded, gagged, and his throat was wired with what was described as a Chinese torture knot. As Hannon struggled, he strangled himself, but all of this was after his genitals had been burnt off with a blowtorch. The coroner determined that Hannon was dead before being dumped in the harbor. Delaney's body showed signs of a vicious beating and strangulation, but the medical examiner found water in his lungs, which meant he was still alive when he was thrown in. After further testing, the medical examiner found evidence of alcohol and tranquilizers in his bloodstream. Delaney had been charged in September of 56 with assault with intent to murder Edmund Fisher. The indictment alleged that Wilfred and his brother Wayne had beat up Fisher and threw him off of a railroad trestle. Fisher lay on the tracks for nearly 24 hours before being found. Wilfred went on the lam and was arrested by the FBI the following August on a warrant charging unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. The two brothers were eventually convicted in October of 57. Wilfred was sent to Walpole, and Wayne was sent to Concord. Delaney was arrested in late August 1961 while attempting to break into a parked cigarette vending truck on Route 35 in Danvers. His partners in crime were William B. O'Sullivan, Spike O'Toole, and Francis Xavier Murray. To make matters worse for themselves, the men tried to bribe the cops not once but twice after their arrest, the first time at the scene of the crime and the second time at the police station. But this only resulted in additional charges. The police also suspected the crew of robberies in Lawrence and Salem over the summer. They were released on $5,000 bail. In late September, O'Sullivan, Murray, and O'Toole were all given suspended sentences and fined $500. Delaney was found innocent, which still seems odd because Delaney's 1957 sentence included a five-year parole period once he got out. Hannon had a 40-year-long criminal record and an awful reputation, including abusing prostitutes. At the time of his killing, he was rumored to have recently robbed a bookie, and that was alleged to have been the motive for his killing. According to Buddy McLean's biography, Hannon was tortured and killed in order to obtain information about Punchy McLaughlin's whereabouts, and Delaney was collateral damage. Buddy McLean allegedly arranged for Dorothy Barshard to lure Hannon and Delaney back to an apartment for sex. They had no clue it was a trap. Hannon gave up the info to Buddy and Joe McDonald that Punchy was meeting people in front of a variety of police stations and wouldn't let anyone know 
his location until just before the meeting. Delaney was also interrogated. I assume that's how the information on the hit on Nicholson was supposedly obtained, but I have to state again that this information is not reliable. As we've picked apart timelines from that book, many events do not ring true. Also, according to his story, it was Joe McDonald who gave the tranquilizers and alcohol to Delaney before strangling him. The coroner said that it was one of the most grisly murder scenes he had ever witnessed. Let's cover what was going on shortly before Hannah and Delaney were killed. In late June, the wiretap at Raymond's picked up a conversation between Raymond Patriaca, Peter Lamoni, and Jerry Angiulo. Jerry stated that Harold Hannon had recently approached Peter Lamoni about the possibility of Georgie McLaughlin surrendering to the authorities. Lamoni contacted Jerry, and Jerry contacted a bail bondsman to see if he'd provide bail to Georgie. The bondsman said he would, but that it was really up to a judge to decide if bail would even be an option given that the charge was murder. Jerry asked about jurisdiction, and the bondsman told him that since no indictment had been returned by the Suffolk County Grand Jury, that it would be up to the district court to make a decision on bail. Jerry told Raymond that he had one condition whereby Georgie would surrender, and that was that he not surrender to the FBI. What Jerry was suggesting was that Hannon should go around the feds and cut them out altogether. I can only imagine how upset Special Agent John Keogh, who was listening to the wiretaps, and the other FBI agents must have been over this slight. The FBI had a warrant out for Georgie for what they said was his unlawful flight to avoid prosecution and had placed him on their top 10 most wanted list. When we were researching this episode, someone called it the most hated list, which is a much more accurate description, in my opinion. But it wasn't just about jurisdiction. The feds had it out for the McLaughlin brothers and were willing to do anything to bring them down. The why of that is still an open question. Frank Salemi testified to Congress that it was because the McLaughlins had made fun of Special Agent H. Paul Rico behind his back because he was always bragging about his relationship with Hoover. He claimed that the McLaughlins were wired too and that the feds heard everything the McLaughlins were saying about them. There are many things in Frank's testimony that are obvious lies and there are some that still strike me as being credible. This is one I'm willing to deem to be on the more credible side. Raymond and Jerry agreed that they would suggest a lawyer to Hannon, but that Hannon would have to make all the negotiations on his own and they would not be involved beyond what they had already done. The following year in January, the Boston Globe ran an article attempting to link the Hannon and Delaney murders to the murder of Philip Goldstein in 1959. We covered Goldstein's murder briefly in our episode about Pro Learner's early days. Pro was arrested for planning to rob Goldstein's son in December of 61. We were able to rule out Pro as a suspect in the murder because he was in South Carolina at that time performing on the baseball field, which was covered in the press. But because of the similarities in how Hannon and Goldstein had been bound and knotted, law enforcement couldn't overlook the possibility that they were killed by the same person. Like the others, no one was ever charged with their murders. The timing is just very suspicious. There's Jerry telling Raymond every little minute detail about Hannon and his negotiations for Georgie, and then about one month later, Hannon gets tortured to death. And that brings back up the two guys from Providence, Biesi and Kalichi, who were seen with Hannon shortly after the conversation on the wiretap. The bottom line is that the people with the most motivation to kill Hannon were the feds, and when Punchy made another attempt in November to get Georgie into protective custody, he was shot at. I know you think it was Red and Pro who made that attempt, and I'm inclined to agree with you, but that just raises more questions about Pro specifically. Well, there's no shortage of duplicity in these stories. To muddy the waters, you have guys claiming hits that weren't theirs. The feds were listening to their conversations and certain feds that wanted certain individuals knocked out of the box and others in charge had access to that information. I still think Pro killed Sheridan, Buddy McLean, and more than likely Punchy. What I'm not so sure of is at whose behest. Pro knew Dad was an informant, as did Jack, so there's the possibility that Pro had access to Rico through him. We know Jack did, so the reasons behind the hits are what I have my doubts about. That's what I'm questioning. Was it really because Punchy and Buddy were shaking down Jack? We'll discuss it further when we cover the hit parade of 1965. But let's get back to 1964. 
The next victim was Leo Iggy Lowry. On September 2nd, Lowry's badly beaten body was discovered by a book salesman at 3 in the afternoon near the edge of Cross Street off of Route 139 in North Pembroke. His throat was slashed, but he died from a bullet fired in the back of his head. He'd been dead a little under 24 hours when his body was discovered. He had last been seen alive on August 31st, leaving a bar in the south end of Boston somewhere between 1.30 and 2 in the morning. The police said that they believe Lowry was slain at some other location and his body dumped. Lowry had served time for breaking and entering, larceny, and two escape attempts, once from Deer Island in 1951 and another from Charles Street in 1952. Lowry had been employed as a foreman at a Boston construction firm at the time of his death. The main suspect in Lowry's murder was Jimmy Fleming. According to Casey Sherman's book, Animal, Lowry was a bisexual and had been prostituting himself while he was in Charlestown State Prison. But upon Lowry's release, he fell for the wife of a gangster who was in the same circle as Joe Barboza and Jimmy Fleming. The unnamed gangster spotted Lowry and his wife leaving a bar and followed them. In a fit of rage, the upset husband tried to cut off Lowry's head. When that proved too difficult, he shot him in the head. A couple of weeks later, the gangster's wife shot him in the leg. Supposedly, Jimmy relayed the story to Barboza. Now, how Jimmy would know that story is the question. Because he did it? Well, yes, but. (laughs) Whether it was over drugs or some jail secret, we'll never know. Lowry's murder also went unsolved, although, again, the feds listed Jimmy Flemmy as his killer. Just two days after Lowry was found, Ronald Dermody's dead body was discovered slumped across the front seat of a parked car on the corner of School and Belmont Streets in Watertown at 11 o'clock in the evening. Just 15 minutes earlier, Ronnie had made a phone call to an attorney he'd been in contact with previously about getting his driver's license reinstated. Speaking of driver's licenses, Spike O'Toole's driver's license was found in Ronnie's wallet. Ronnie was trying to go straight and had a chance at a new job, but now the cops were after him. They'd been informed that Ronnie had been the one who had shot at 33-year-old Charles Robinson on Broadway in Somerville the previous night. According to his attorney, Ronnie was clearly upset. At times he bordered on incoherence. He was frantic. Ronnie told him, the cops are after me everywhere. They think I shot some guy in Somerville. I didn't do it. If I did, I wouldn't even bother you. I'm leveling with you. I can't take care of my, I can take care of myself. It's my wife I'm worried about. The cops went to my house and kicked in my door. You've got to help her. She hasn't got anything to do with it. Well, have your wife call me at this number. I'll be there in a half an hour, the lawyer promised. There was a slight pause in the conversation as Germany fumbled for a piece of paper and pencil to write down the number. The lawyer waited for the second call, but it never came. The next day he learned that Dermody was dead. According to the attorney, Dermody was on his way to contact his wife. The lawyer said that Dermody gave no indication in the conversation that he feared someone wanted to kill him. Ronnie had allegedly made another phone call that night to someone else that he thought could help him, FBI Special Agent H. Paul Rico. Ronnie knew Rico from back in the mid-50s when he'd been arrested for robbing a bank in Pawtucket with Whitey Bulger. But unbeknownst to Ronnie, Buddy McLean was a favorite confidential informant of Rico's, Rico set up a meeting with Ronnie, but Rico didn't show up alone. He had Buddy with him. Buddy shot Ronnie three times in the head through a partially opened window on the passenger side of the vehicle. The fatal bullet struck Ronnie in the neck and passed out on the left side of his head, leaving a trickle of blood that ran down his face. A witness reported hearing the gunshots, then about a minute later, the slamming of a car door and a car engine firing up. Her husband stepped outside in time to see Rico and Buddy driving away in a blue sedan. The two men returned to Rico's home in Belmont, where Rico let Buddy hide out in his basement until the danger of arrest had passed. Ronnie was the first of Whitey Bulger's original crew to be released from prison, and the first to be murdered. The reason given for why Buddy wanted to kill Dermody was that Dermody had made some insane deal with the McLaughlins to kill Buddy if the McLaughlins would kill Spike O'Toole. They also ran the story that It was Ronnie who shot at the guy in Somerville, mistaking him for Buddy, which makes no sense because he was, as we know, Spike was on the McLaughlin side and he was sitting in jail when Ronnie was supposed to have gone to the McLaughlins to make this deal. Spike also had two children with Dorothy Barchard, who was Ronnie's sister-in-law. I want to touch briefly on Special Agent H. Paul Rico's FBI career up to this point. 
He applied to be an FBI agent in the wake of the Brinks heist and finished his training in April of 51. He returned to Boston on a hardship request in March of 52 because his father was ill. In March of 56, Rico and his partner, Special Agent Herbert Brick, arrested Whitey Bulger in a bar in Revere. The story goes that Rico already knew Whitey from his days hustling in local gay bars, where Rico supposedly went to recruit informants. Rico received a promotion as a result of his successful apprehension of Bulger. In addition to this achievement, Whitey convinced his accomplice's wife, Dorothy Barshard, to become a confidential informant for the FBI, a role that she played well into the late 1960s, if not beyond. Rico tried to recruit Dad when he was locked up in Charles Street in 1957, but according to Dad, he refused to cooperate and Rico hated him on the spot. However, five years later, things changed. Rico knew that Dad was running machine guns for the McLaughlins and trapped him while he was doing just that. With the threat of a lifetime in prison hanging over his head, Dad agreed to become a confidential informant for the FBI. Rico was juggling multiple CIs by 1964, and not just Dad. His portfolio included Dorothy Barchard, Buddy McLean, George Ash, Jimmy Flemmie, and his brother Stevie, to name a few. I personally think that Ronnie was killed because of his past association with Whitey Bulger. He knew too much. Every single one of Whitey Bulger's original crew was murdered except for two people, Richard and Dorothy Barchard. Why Richard was allowed to live out his days in relative peace is another mystery. What did he have to do or promise to make that happen? He went to the grave with that secret. Rico probably put that story out about Dorothy and Ronnie, and the media never mentioned that Dorothy was Ronnie's sister-in-law, so they all bought it. I agree with you. You know, the first thing is the mistaken identity thing about Buddy McLean, which is the same excuse they used in Georgie's case. And the whole story about Ronnie wanting to be with Dorothy and wanting to kill Buddy for that privilege is insane. Spike was in jail at that time, and forgive me, but Ronnie would have needed more than Spike out of the way considering how many guys Dorothy was keeping company with. But it was only the story that got any traction. Like the others, no one was ever charged in Ronnie's murder. It's horrible. The next to be killed was Carlton Eaton. Eaton was found dead on September 26th. Earlier that year, Eaton had been arrested with Iggy Lowry on charges of writing bad checks. At the time of Eaton's killing, he was estranged from his wife and three kids. His record went back to 1948 and included convictions for breaking and entering, bad checks, and auto thefts. He served time both in Concord and Plymouth. Joseph Barboza said that he killed Eaton while he was driving. Eaton was in the front passenger seat and Nikki Femia was in the back of the car. After shooting Eaton, Barboza realized that some of Eaton's brain matter was in his hair. Barboza proceeded to put it in his mouth, but he spit out the piece of his skull. Barboza claimed that he killed Eaton because he had stolen Chico Amico's diving equipment and owed him money from a bet Eaton made with Amico. Barboza was never charged with Eaton's murder, nor was anyone else. The next slaying victim was Anthony Sacramoni. Sacramoni was murdered in Everett in the early morning hours of October 17, 1964. He was stabbed four times in his head and neck before being shot twice in the back of the head. The Everett police said, quote, whoever murdered Sacramoni first tried to stab him to death, then went berserk and shot him when the knife failed to kill. Everything about that description says Jimmy Flemmy murdered Sacramoni, but the feds were covering for Jimmy and told the Everett police that Teddy Deegan had committed the murder. They claimed that Teddy and Sacramoni were in the car doing drugs and Teddy lost control and attacked Sacramoni. That makes no sense. Anthony Sacramoni and his brother America were both with Buddy McLean from the time that America was in the can with Buddy. Everyone knew that, just like everyone knew Teddy was with the McLaughlins. I don't care how much of a junkie you were, there's no way you're getting in a car with the enemy. And I never once heard anything about Teddy being on drugs. Dad's crew gossiped as much as Raymond and Jerry about the other guy's personal lives. If someone was an addict, they would have been going on about it endlessly. But as we know, Jimmy was an addict and would later die from a heroin overdose in prison. Although no one was ever tried for Anthony Sacramoni's murder, it is more than likely that this killer was Jimmy Fleming. There were two slayings in November. William J. Trini in, on November 13th and Edward P. Huber on November 26th. Trini's body was found dismembered in two suitcases in the trunk of a car in Boston's South End. 
Huber's body was found in Hingham. He was estranged from his wife and had been roommates with Trini. Trini, Huber, John Murray, and George Ash were allegedly involved in a burglary ring, which the authorities claimed pulled off 1,500 burglaries in 18 months. I don't know how they came up with that number because the math doesn't work. That's like three burglaries a day, every day, with no off days. George would be killed the next month. We'll talk about that shortly. John Murray was killed in January of 65. We'll be discussing that in episode 32. Their other two roommates were arrested for their murders. William Murray and Robert Cook were charged. Murray was acquitted, but Robert Cook was convicted of the slaying of Triani and sentenced to life. An unnamed witness who was in protective custody testified that Triani had killed Huber and was also the one who disposed of his body in Hingham with the help of the mystery witness. Great. Another innocent guy who probably got shafted by these people. On December 16th, George P. O'Brien was killed. He was shot three times on East Broadway in South Boston. It was believed not to be related to the gang war, but rather the result of a barroom brawl. O'Brien's record consisted of petty crimes. He and two men who were in the bar that evening had been charged the week before for breaking and entering and were each released on $10,000 bail. In early 1965, the police said they had a 25-year-old suspect from Southie that they were investigating, but he was never arrested, nor was anyone else. The final murder of 1964 was George Ash, who was killed on Christmas night. Ash was stabbed 50 times and shot in the head. His body was discovered in the front seat of his sedan at roughly 6 a.m. on the 26th. J. Edgar Hoover was informed of the murder on the same day that it took place. It was believed that Jimmy Fleming murdered George Ash because he found out that Ash was also an informant for the FBI. George Ash had made a deal in 1959 to get a reduced sentence on a murder accessory charge. His handler was Special Agent H. Paul Rico, who also happened to be Jimmy's handler. Ash had been released from prison in May of 64. I want to note that Ash was a bartender at the club that Jack Kelly and his crew frequented. The brutality of Ash's murder is very similar to that of Anthony Sacrimony, which in my mind definitely screams of Jimmy Flemmy's handiwork. The feds all the way up to Hoover were aware of this and continued to use Flemmy as an informant anyway. Jimmy was only later dropped as a top echelon informant when he became a fugitive after failing to appear in court. I believe that there were other FBI informants that have never been named and that it is likely that more than a few ended up like George Ash, victims of H. Paul Rico and his favorites. I agree, and I still believe that Rico had it in for the McLaughlins because of the conversations that got back to him of Georgie saying that Rico was having threesomes with Hoover and Tolson and that even Rico's fellow feds couldn't stand him because of his constant bragging about his relationship with Hoover. It's one of the few stories of Salemis that I buy. Well, that's it for today. Thank you all for listening. I've updated our website. You can now leave us voicemails in addition to sending us emails. If you have any information or thoughts you'd like to share, please feel free to message us. We love hearing from you. Next week's episode is titled The Defense Never Rests in honor of the late F. Lee Bailey's book. We'll be covering the defense attorneys of these men and dad self-proclaimed double agent status that included cigar tubes and mice. You'll have to listen to hear that story. Also, I want to thank you guys for sharing our episodes. Our downloads are on the way up. Please keep sharing, following, and leaving reviews. Bye. Bye. Double Deal. True stories of criminals, crimes, and lies.